It's half past one and I see the, the participants are slowly joining again after our busy and fruitful morning session. So I suggest as well we, uh, we slowly start this afternoon because we are going to start it with, with quite a bang, I would say, and quite a, quite a powerful intervention from our special guest. Um, just a reminder, we're meeting here in the context of policy area culture of the European Union strategy for the Baltic Sea region. So this is a discussion about, uh, about future strategy. There is, of course, a very, very concrete um, discussion that we'll need to have in the afternoon on this uh, interreg application uh, for the next three years on how policy area culture coordinators together with, with different partners among this, of course, uh, our dear participants. Um, can shape the, um, the topic. Of course, it's, 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 it's one of 14 policy area cultures, so we are operating in this broader scope and broader spectrum of, 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 of topics, also linking, of course, to, um, to European Union and global priorities. Um, so I'm very happy now, first of all, to, to, to give the floor to Patrick to, to introduce our special guest. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what Simon will have to, to share with us. And as promised, uh, after his intervention, we'll also have some time uh, for a Q&A session. So I hope you also have your questions ready after your lunch and that you're ready to, to dive in into, into the afternoon part of, of our meeting. So Patrick, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So yes, on behalf of Adam Mitzkirch Institute, I had the pleasure to introduce our special guest, Simon Anholt will provide us some food for thought on the subject of BSR region international reputation, its challenges and potential for uh, future development. I hope that this short presentation will be an inspiring input, uh, inspiring input for our discussions during the final part of our workshops. Uh, and please re be reminded that we'll, uh, we'll record and distribute only this, uh, on this keynote speech part and the Q&A session will be used only for our uh, internal uh, purposes. I think uh, Simon might not need uh, a, a broader uh, uh, broader presentation, but I'll just like to shortly introduce him to, to, to all of you as he's a well-known international consultant with over 20 years of experience in advising politicians, stakeholders, and decision makers of nearly 60 countries, cities, and regions, and basically helping them to engage more productively and imaginatively with the international community. His, as for, for, for myself, uh, myself, his best known research project is probably the Good Country Index, um, about which you might have heard of, which is measuring countries' international reputation by measuring how much do they contribute to the global good. And he also produces two, uh, two major global surveys uh, tracking public perceptions of countries and cities is the Anhalt Ipsos National Brands Index and City Brand Index. And his latest, latest books I can also re recommend you to, 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 to have a read of is The Good Country Equation, How We Can Repair the World in One Generation. So I hope you'll find his input interesting. And now, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you once again for, uh, for, for, for being able to, uh, to give us your input. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. And good afternoon, everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about my thoughts on the image of the Baltic Sea region, because this is not a new subject to me. Um, it's a subject which uh, I've been involved in discussing for quite a few years. In fact, when uh, Patrick and Maciej invited me to give this talk, I looked back over my own records and I discovered to my surprise that um, back in 2005, I was invited by the Baltic Development Forum to contribute to a series of discussions that were being held then about the international image of the Baltic Sea region. And I was tasked with developing um, a brand strategy for the, for the region. I was, and still am today, skeptical about the whole idea of branding places. I know this may sound like an odd thing for me to say because I'm normally accused of being the guy who invented the term um, place branding, nation branding. But in reality, the idea that you can somehow artificially manipulate perceptions of places is entirely false. There really is no such thing as international propaganda. Domestic propaganda is sadly very possible. 
you can manipulate the perceptions of your own citizens if you control all the channels of communication that reach them. But internationally, of course, that's not the case. And although I've been researching this area now for more than 20 years, I still haven't found a single properly documented example of a country, a city or a region that has demonstrably changed its image through communications. And an awful lot of governments have wasted an awful lot of money trying to do so. But my research and plenty of other research shows that there is absolutely no correlation between the amount of money that governments spend on trying to improve or promote their images and the perceptions of those countries thereafter by international public opinion. The reality of the matter is that most people only ever think about three countries. That's what the research tells us. They think a little bit about their own country, a little bit about some big powerful country like America or China, and a little bit about another country that they have some personal interest in, but that's it, three. So expecting people to start thinking about not just another country, but indeed a region that they've probably never heard of before unless they live in Europe is asking a lot. And it's really, really very unlikely that you're ever going to be able to succeed in doing that. In fact, regions with international images are very rare animals. Tuscany is a region with an international image. California is a region with an international image. Europe is a region with an international image. But that's about it as far as it goes. So the concept of a region is not a, um, is not a common one in people's everyday thinking. So I, I said to myself, uh, and I wrote it in my report back in 2005, it's going to take a long time to do this. And it can't be done with messages. It can only be done with actions, with deeds, with behavior. And I wrote this, when we talk of, quote, branding the Baltic Sea region, we're not talking about a promotional campaign, but something more strategic, more fundamental, and far more important. We're talking about creating a stronger and more competitive identity for the region through a clearly articulated sense of common purpose. We need, long -term, we need a long-term plan for earning and maintaining a distinctive positive and competitive regional reputation, both within Europe and around the world. It will be achieved through a strategic, harmonized approach to innovation, policymaking, international relations and public diplomacy, investment and export promotion, tourism and cultural relations. Now, the reason why I put cultural relations last was not because I thought it was the least important of those factors, but because it was the subject of the following 27 pages. But I'll come back to that in a second. As I say, there is no proved correlation between deliberate propaganda messaging and the image of countries. So if propaganda doesn't work, what does? And that's a really interesting question because certain countries and certain regions do have better images than others. Where does that come from? How do they manage to achieve that better image? Because nobody doubts that a good image is extraordinarily useful to countries, cities, and regions. If you have a good image, everything is easy and everything is cheap. You can get more tourists, you can get more foreign investment, you can get more talent, your cultural relations are easier and pleasanter, everything is easy. If you have a negative or a weak reputation, everything is difficult and everything is expensive. So there's no question that it's a valuable thing, but where does it come from? So in 2012, I did a meta-analysis of the more than 1 billion data points of research, which I'd conducted on the images of uh, 60 countries for the previous 20 years to try and find out what does actually drive a positive reputation, a positive image. And I discovered, to cut a long story short, that the main reason why a country has a positive image is because people perceive that it contributes something of value to the world outside its own borders. In other words, people don't admire countries that treat their own citizens well. People don't necessarily admire successful or rich or fast growing or even beautiful countries. They admire countries that appear to be useful to the planet and to humanity. Now, I don't know how recent this is because I've only done the measurement once. I suspect it may not have been the case in 1760 or in 1890 or even in 1910, but it's certainly the, 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 the situation today. The most likely reason why people would admire a country, a city or a region is because they feel glad that it exists. It contributes something to the world in which they live. They don't care how happy its citizens are. 
They don't care how beautiful its beaches are. They don't care how much money it makes. They just want to feel that they don't have to worry about it. So that was why uh, in 2014, I launched the Good Country Index, uh, which Patrick kindly mentioned. That's an attempt to measure actually not reputation, but behavior. Which countries actually do contribute the most to the world outside their own borders? Because it's quite a complicated question. I don't think I'm going to spoil the results by telling you that it's always Scandinavian countries on the top, but we, we knew that without even checking. The interesting thing is that there is an 80% correlation between the Good Country Index and the Nation Brands Index. So the countries that give most to the world are strongly correlated with the countries that are most admired. About this, there is very little question. So what that means in terms of how you promote your own country or your own region to the rest of the world is that it should be demand-based, not supply-based. In other words, you shouldn't be thinking, what's cool about us that we ought to tell everybody about? You should be thinking, what do people need that we could provide? What do they want to learn that we could teach? What do they want to buy that we can sell? What do they regard as broken that we could fix? That's the correct question. It's more about telling people how you resolve your problems than about claiming that you don't have any problems because people are really interested in how other countries, cities and regions resolve their problems. And at this point, I would really like to do a little pitch for Latvia. I have absolutely no connection with this um, particular um, project at all, but it is one of the most exciting and in the true sense of the word postmodern nation branding initiatives I've ever come across. Uh, Latvia, in case you aren't aware, is launching something called C2030. And it is a project uh, to, to basically clean up the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea, as I'm sure you know, is <laughs> it's quite funny. Every single ocean on Earth claims to be the most polluted ocean on the planet. Um, I don't know why everybody is competing with each other to have this um, rather awful title, but the Baltic Sea apparently has a pretty good case to make for being the most polluted sea on the planet. And um, what the Latvian government, or more specifically, the Latvian um, uh, pro Export Promotion Agency have decided to do is instead of wasting a lot of taxpayers' money on messages about how wonderful Latvia is, they're going to start a very, very um, ambitious multi-year, multi-decade project to clean up the Baltic Sea. And that, they believe, will be the reason why humanity will eventually feel grateful that Latvia exists. Now, I think this is an absolutely fantastic initiative. I've never seen anything half as good by anybody else. Let me just quote very briefly um, Kaspars Roschkans, the director of the Latvian um, uh, Promotion Agency. He says, with the mission C2030, Latvia stands internationally for the availability of clean water for every inhabitant of the world. That is the message we want to convey to the world. This can be achieved by developing a new economy that restores the natural clean water system. Now, the only thing that I would add to the Latvians, and I've told them this already, to what is, I believe, an extraordinarily exciting and ambitious uh, plan, is that they can't do it on their own. Latvia is a small country with limited resources. It's also a small country with a very weak image. It's a country that is not well known outside Europe at all. And the associations that most people have with Latvia, as indeed with all of the Baltic states, is primarily negative because it consists mainly of vague recollections of the Soviet Union and nothing else. If that sounds very cruel, I'm sorry, but that is just the way that public opinion works, as I'm sure we all know. Now, the interesting thing is that what I've discovered is that if countries work together with other countries to carry out initiatives of this sort, it actually does not dilute the reputational benefits of that project for them. It actually intensifies them. And that's for a very good reason. It's because countries are not just judged by what they do. They're also judged by the company they keep. And if the world sees Latvia working with, for example, the Nordic countries and with its, Latvian, uh, its uh, Baltic neighbors and with other countries in Central and Eastern Europe and indeed everywhere around the Baltic Sea, that will actually make it look better, not worse. It will gain more credit for C2030, not less. So the thing that I've been saying to the, to the, to the Latvian government ever since I first heard about this marvelous project is, make sure that the keynote of everything you do 
is cooperation and collaboration. Otherwise, there's a risk that it looks like competition. And just a word on competition. I don't have a problem with competition. It's part of human nature. Competition is responsible for having lifted billions of people out of poverty over the last centuries and decades. Competition is a useful thing, but it becomes a problem when it's the only altar at which we worship. And that has been the problem for the last hundred years or so. What we need to do now is we need to start working out how to mix competition and collaboration. Industry has shown us since the 1970s that you can do that. You can compete and collaborate and cooperate at the same time. And the effect of that is magical. So my recommendation for the Baltic Sea region today would be a single sentence. Sit down with Latvia and figure out how the whole region can work on turning it into the least polluted sea in the world and then work with every other sea all around the world to show how they can do the same. So you turn it into freeware and you work together. This, I guarantee, would improve the image not only of Latvia, but also of the Baltic Sea region, of all of the countries that are involved. And it would probably only take about 20 years to achieve, which is pretty quick, in my opinion. So I said that the only thing that you need to do is to show people what you do. But that's not quite true. You also need to show them who you are. And this, I think, is the real function of cultural relations. I'm always a little bit nervous about being seen to be promoting the instrumentalization of culture. But the reality of the matter is that culture does bring benefits to countries. And therefore, the discussion about instrument, instrumentalization is also uh, is almost unavoidable. Cultural relations is a way for people to meet the inhabitants of other countries. And once they've met you and they've got to know you through your cultural expressions, and a miraculous thing happens. It means that in the future, they can hate what you do, but they can't hate you because they know you. And I've seen this work time and time again for other countries. Most of the countries around the Baltic Sea region have very mixed images from the cultural perspective. None of them are particularly associated with culture, certainly not cultural heritage, certainly not high culture. The Nordics, no more than the Baltics, possibly one or two countries in Central and Eastern Europe, I'm thinking particularly of Czechia and Hungary, have a very high reputation for cultural heritage. But on the whole, this is not a region that is associated with cultural heritage or high culture. So in a sense, we're all at the starting block here. And a way to get people to understand who is it who's working on this project? Who is it who's trying to save the world's oceans through their own backyard, if you like? The best way to do that is to use collaborative, not competitive cultural relations amongst all of those Baltic Sea neighbors to let the world know who you are, and then they will understand why you're doing this. And I think that recipe, although it sounds a little bit complicated, there's really only two parts to it. And it may take 20 years, but 20 years, as I said, is not very long. The best thing of all about it is that it doesn't cost very much. There is absolutely no necessity to spend vast amounts of money on designing stupid logos and slogans and advertising campaigns. It's just a waste of money. It ends up in the pockets of advertising companies. None of us want that. The point about cultural relations, as we all know, is that it doesn't have to be terribly expensive. It requires enormously skilled, committed, dedicated people, and it requires a great deal of thinking and a little bit of time, but in the end, it works. Cleaning the Baltic Sea will cost an enormous amount of money, but at least that's money well spent and we don't have to feel guilty about wasting it. So I'll leave it at that um, and look forward to hearing your questions. Amazing. Thank you very much, Simon. I think you gave us a lot of inspiring thoughts. Thank you. for our way ahead. We're also quite lucky to have Latvia among us because we have the representative of Latvian Culture Ministries. So I hope she's also happy that okay. Latvia got a special recognition from you. But now I'm, I'm happy to turn to, to the colleagues. 